My name is Maria Meyer, the Interim Executive Director of the Women's Fund Miami-Dade. Welcome you all. I'm going to fly through it. Usually I have a big W behind me. This is your Women's Fund. Um, I am going to say that we hope to see you all many times. It's a place that you can come to connect with us. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about what the Women's Fund is doing these days, but I'm only going to limit myself to saying that we have really active committees. And some of those committees um, have brilliant um, volunteer members from the community that aren't necessarily board members. And Vicki Lopez is one of them. And uh, we'll talk about those opportunities more in the future. For now, I need to welcome a very special birthday girl, our board chair, Gloria Romero Roses. And uh, I'm gonna let you take it away to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that uh, well wish, Maria. But uh, the privilege really is mine to be in this amazing Zoom room with 48 advocates and activists in your own right. We at the Women's Fund embrace every one of you and the work that you're doing to make Miami-Dade the place we love be better. At the end of the day, this is all about how do we truly have Miami Day be the place where women and girls can thrive, especially coming out of this pandemic induced recession. So, with no further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and colleague who's been in the trenches on criminal justice, juvenile justice reform, um, my spiritual sister, I like to say. Vicki Lopez is a consummate professional, and we are just thrilled to not only have her in our alumni of board members for the Women's Fund, but for her to rejoin as an active committee member for our advocacy and legislative affairs committee. So thank you so much, Vicki, for your time and talent, and we look forward to um, learning more from you. Thank you so much, Gloria and Maria, and um, really the members of the Women's Fund board for the invitation to share some of my expertise with you all. It's so great to be here with so many friends um, and, and meeting new people who are as uh, passionate about advocacy as I am. Vicki, you just muted yourself. We can't hear you. Sorry. Um, I was going to say that I'm gonna do, and I'm having some difficulties with my, hang on for a second, sorry. Um, I was gonna go over some, now I hang on for one second. Let me try to get back to where I was. Okay, great. Let's go over some housekeeping um, items if you don't mind. Um, if you aren't speaking, please put yourself on mute. You can certainly identify yourself by name and organization on your profile there on your picture. Um, please feel free to type questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring them. You can also unmute yourself to ask a question. So just feel free to raise your hand because I'm gonna take questions along the way. I think it's important. We're gonna have a lot of information um, to share. Um, and I think it's important that we take those questions within the context of the material that is being presented. Uh, I am a firm believer that interaction is very valuable and very important. There are some incredible people on this um, in, in this workshop today that I know personally about their advocacy histories. Um, and I really hope that you will, you know, step up to the plate and step in when you have um, something important to say. The training is being recorded, um, so if you miss some of it or want to rehear it, and there, they will be launching some polls um, during the presentation, so please be sure um, to answer them. So here are, and I think um, uh, Vivi is going to launch our first uh, poll. Um, which really is going to give, gauge us in um, learning why you attended this, this, um, this workshop, because many of you have differing degrees of experience in advocacy. So she will be throwing that up while I just quickly go through what we're going to be, what our goals are for today. Um, and I think that this was all in, the, um, in your registration, but we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between an activist and an advocate. And I'm also going to add the caveat of lobbyist. Um, which is what I do for a living, um, the definition of advocacy and its importance, what it means to advocate under the Women's Fund umbrella, um, skills and, and strategies for advocating and promoting issues that impact women and girls, the difference between local, state, and federal advocacy. I'm going to hopefully prepare you for your advocacy efforts, help you to find and contact legislators and local officials and set the groundwork for your 
uh, relationships, types of advocacy communications, and the importance of the, the one and only one pager, how to interact with your elected officials to have an effective visit, and then how to maintain a relationship to be a resource for the elected official and their staff. So let's talk about the difference between an advocate and an activist and an advocate. So, so all of you were asked when you registered, you know, which one do you um, most, what leadership role most interests you? And we had four people who were interested in political office, 20 activists and the remaining were advocates. And so I think it's really uh, helpful for us to see the difference, right? So an activist is a person who strongly believes in a political or social change, right? So not, not unlike the advocate, but here's the part that really is the difference, right? They take part in activities such as public protests, you've seen this, and they try to make it happen. Um, I wanna give you a, I've always used this as an example of an activist, um, and it was a story um, from 1999, but it rings so true today because Shukriya Barakazi uh, is an Afghanistan woman and, um, her story, uh, and I'll briefly just tell you the story because it really does demonstrate what an activist is. So uh, Shukriya was in 1999, she was um, actually feeling a little dizzy and feverish. Um, and according to the Taliban rules, she could not leave the house without a maharam, which is really a male guardian. So she couldn't go to the doctor unless she had a maharam and her husband was at work and she didn't have any sons. Now, mind you, imagine, that you're not feeling well. So what did she do? She took her two-year-old daughter and shaved her daughter's head, dressed her in boy's clothing to pass her off as a guardian. So imagine the Taliban, they don't care who it is, as long as it's a man, it can be a two-year-old. And so she went and grabbed, um, her, you know, she put on her burqa and she had red fingernail polish and she hid them inside her burqa. And she asked a neighbor to walk with her because she thought she would be safer that way. And so they walked to the doctor in central Kabul and she went to the doctor and left with a prescription. And on the way to the pharmacy, there was a truckload of Taliban. They jumped out. Um, they were from the Ministry of the Propagation of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, mind you. That's a department in the Taliban government. And they regularly drove around Kabul just looking for women who might not be, you know, who would be propagating, you know, not virtue. So what happened is they jumped out of the truck and they started whipping her with a rubber cable, so much so that she fell to the ground and they continued to whip her. And later on, um, Shukriya said, um, they don't even know why they're beating us. They just beat us because now they enjoy beating us, even though they have no reason, right? So what did she do, right? Because an advocate, and I'll tell you what an advocate would do. An advocate would try to change the government. Oh no, not Shukriya. Shukriya decided that she credits that very moment. So mind you, you always have a moment that changes you. She credits that moment in her life of creating a life of advocacy and activism. So when Afghanistan's capital descended into civil war by 1992, she was actually studying, and I have to read this, hydrometeorology and geophysics at Kabul University. Pretty bright woman, right? But when the Taliban came in, by 1996, all Afghan women were, um, were forced to leave their studies. So what did she do at the very, and I like to say at the very peril of her own safety and the safety of her family, she decided to organize underground classes for the girls that were living in her sprawling apartment complex um, where she and her family lived. So it was 45 families that she decided to take in on this kind of secret activity. And she went on to draft Afghanistan's constitution and serve two terms in parliament. That's an activist, okay? An advocate publicly supports or suggest an idea, development, or way of doing things. So if Shukriya had decided to be an advocate, she might've gone to talk to the Taliban, you know, the, the minister of this, you know, what was it called? The Ministry of Propagation of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. And she might've said, you know, it might make it easier on women if you didn't beat them just simply because they're walking on the street, right? So it's, it's a telling story for me because it, it used to be really important today given what's happening in Afghanistan, it really rings true that this is what the women and girls will be facing now under the new Taliban rule. 
So what does advocacy do? It advances your organization's mission. All of you seem to be representing your own organization or an interest that you have personally or professionally. So you're telling the nonprofit's story to a potential funder every day. I'm sure you're raising money. Hopefully you're talking to a reporter or someone from the press about your organization's impact in the community. I'm sure most of you are encouraging volunteers to help you in local community events. I bet you are talking to government officials about the impact that you're uh, making, and then you're educating. So advocates are really good at educating not only policymakers, but the actual community. So now we get to the difference about lobbying. And you know, um, I spoke to Arathi this morning and she said, oh, I hope you're gonna cover that. And of course, because while all lobbying is advocacy, not all advocacy is lobbying. And it's really important that you know the difference. I love this definition of advocacy by the Alliance for Justice. And, and, it, and notice that it encompasses everything. It's, it's an action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends or pleads on behalf of others. It includes public education, regulatory work, litigation, work before administrative bodies, a little bit of lobbying, nonpartisan voter registration, nonpartisan voter education, and so much more. You get the drift. But lobbying is so specific. It's defined as communicating with decision makers and who is the decision maker, an elected official, their staff, and voters if there are ballot measures about existing, now mind you, about existing or potential legislation, including appropriations and urging a vote for or against. And the three components that have to be in lobbying is that there are decision makers involved, there's actual legislation and you're asking for a vote, right? Well, so what happens? Now you gotta face down the IRS because if you're a nonprofit and I know most of you know this but I like to remind you, the IRS has this very uh, clear um, uh, you know, a uh, statute that says an organization will be regarded as attempting to influence legislation if it contacts or urges the public to contact members or employees of a legislative body for the purpose of proposing, supporting, or opposing legislation, or if the organization advocates the adoption or rejection of legislation. Well, that's pretty much what we're all doing. And that's what we're hoping you'll do moving forward if you're not already doing it. So you're a 501c3, let's assume. You can engage in lobbying, but here's what the, it's in quotes because this is what the tax code, what, what an IRS officer would tell you, but too much lobbying activity risks the loss of a tax exempt status. And why? Because section 501c3, which all of you are governed if you're a nonprofit, it says no substantial. The operative word in that sentence is substantial. Part of your activities, which is carrying out what they call propaganda, or otherwise attempting to influence legislation, except otherwise provided in section H. And we'll talk about H in a minute. So you would think that they would have told you what substantial means, right? Well, they didn't. Neither Congress nor the IRS decided to define insubstantial or substantial. So now you're left with, well, my God, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is that all of you should in my opinion, all of you should consider a 501H election, which is to avoid the uncertainty of you all being somehow measured under a subjective test. You would just file this very short form, and I love the way they say it, a very short form with a long name. And what does that form do? It tells the IRS, look at, instead of you measuring us by some sort of, you know, kind of hazy and non-defined term, we would rather be measured by the objective ex expenditure test instead. And so the great thing about the 501H election is that you remain a 501C3, right? So you don't have to become a 501C4, which is a different organization that does a lot more lobbying. And that will allow you to opt out of what's known as the substantial activity test and to use what we call the friendlier ex um, expenditure test. And here's the expenditures, it's really easy. Um, it, most of you are not spending $500,000 to lobby or to advocate. So you fall under the 20%. So if you're spending 20% of your amount of your, of your business now in lobbying, that's what will be exempt. The rest of it would not be, right? So it's important that you recognize that advocating and lobbying has a different impact in different places. And this is the first place that you have to think about because this obviously has a lot to do with your 501c3 because if they find that you have spent too much money, you lose your 501c3. 
So that's the IRS on one side. Now let's go to why advocacy is so important to what we do. There are so many definitions of advocacy. If you go into Google and you put in advocacy, you'll drive yourself crazy. Um, and different countries and different cultures use it differently. The first known use of the word was in the 14th century, um, and it meant the act or process of supporting a cause or a proposal. Now, for those of you that know French, avocat is the term for lawyer. That makes sense. A lawyer advocates on behalf of his, his or her client. And so that would probably be where the genesis of this, this word finally you know, kind of surfaced. But it is a set of targeted actions directed at dis decision makers in support of a specific policy. But it's not just policy work with elected officials and decision makers. You're influencing public opinion all the time and it is critically important. And you'll see why when we move forward, because if the public is not on your side, they are against you. And then it's you against them. And let me tell you who the elected officials listening to. The squeakiest wheel with the most power, and it's usually in numbers. So an advocacy is also a public activity. And I, I, I love to tell you that lobbying requires behind the scenes activities by its very essence. We do a lot of strategy behind the scenes and advocates right up front in their face, not me. I'm behind the scenes, moving pieces, counting votes. So it's very different. But I feel like most of you are advocates in this in this particular um, instance. So what does what does advocacy do besides get you what the one thing that you're trying to get done um, when you advocate? So it shifts social norms, and we have found that to be the case. You can change awareness. Some people are not even aware of some of the things that we're talking about. You can change beliefs, attitudes, values, and public behavior, which is obviously the number one thing that we're trying to do. But you can also strengthen your own organizational capacity. You know, imagine how management capacity improves and how your strategic abilities are going to improve because you are now becoming the world's greatest strategist. And your capacity to communicate and advocate um, and, and really put those messages out into the community are going to increase. And this is the one I love most because I love working in groups. You're going to strengthen your alliances. The number of partners that support your issue and the level of collaboration between those partners is going to be invaluable to not only your success, but to your future success. And then, of course, you're going to support you're going to you're going to strengthen your your support base big time. I mean, you get the media on your side. They're your biggest friends. They buy ink by the barrel. And nowadays they don't even have to buy ink. They just buy digital space. Um, so, you know, having having the media behind you, having a breadth of of partners supporting the issue and your visibility of a campaign, which the Women's Fund is famous for. They love awareness campaigns, and that is what's put them on the map in many ways when, it, when they talk about policy um, discussions. Of course, we'll have improved policies. And of course, the final, and final thing that we're all looking for is some sort of change in impact, right? Either social or physical impact for the people that we, we speak for. So here is where the Women's Fund is taking a real leadership. They have created an advocacy committee, and you've met their co-chairs, Danielle Prendergast, Dr. Prendergast, and Adele Valencia. And the members of that committee are Deanne, Yvonne, who wasn't, couldn't be with us today, and Priscilla, but myself. And the goal is very simple. You know, and I like simple goals, and I like them to not be too specific, but they're seeking to engage our community in policies that impact women and girls to ensure that Miami-Dade County is the best place in the world for women and girls to live, work, and thrive. And that pretty much is a wide umbrella. It, it, we're going to be able to do a lot of things within it, but we want to do it within the impact pillars, the impact collaborative pillars. And we'll see that when we tell you how we've reviewed the, the mayor's upcoming budget. So here's a perfect example of what the Women's Fund has done just recently. Um, so, you know, Maria, uh, you know, with her strength and her voice, um, really felt um, that, that emergency management needed to have a, somewhat of a gender lens. And she proposed to the city of Miami to include pregnant people in their emergency management website. That's the website address, but look at what, what she was able to do. Exposures to high temperatures for pregnant people have been linked to premature birth, low birth weight, and even stillbirth. Pregnant women are also more vulnerable to heat stress themselves. Now, that's a huge distinction, right? Because if Maria had not worked hard on this, on behalf of the Women's Fund, pregnant women would be lost. 
it wouldn't even be a it wouldn't be a conversation. There would be no policy. There would be no education amongst the emergency management team to put a special emphasis on them. So in her one effort, she's managed to make great impact across the county and an important one to boot. And there she is doing what she does best. She's got the mayor of the city of Miami, Mayor Suarez and Mayor Levine Cava, the, the, the strong mayor from the Miami-Dade County. And there she is making her case, right? And really, and really forming those relationships um, because she's going to need them in the future. So it's really love, it's a lovely picture to show really what it looks like when you really are a successful advocate. So let's talk about the power of advocating under the umbrella of the Women's Fund. Look, we call this advocacy networking and all of us who've been in this field for many, many, many years now know that we can't go at it alone. There's just no way. Um, and networks are an invaluable sort of a piece of what we call policy advocacy because it creates organizational structures, right? So all individual organizations or individuals can now share in the ownership of a common goal, right? And we can we can actually get really well organized and operate far more efficiently than if we all went at it alone. Um, and we bring together our resources, our time, energy, and talents of so many people. And, and I say that because I know that in this workshop, there are so, there's so much talent. And I'm excited about, you know, sort of inviting you all to share that talent, um, not only now, but throughout um, throughout the, uh, the workshop. And I don't know, um, Maria, if please stop me if you all see any questions in the chat that I haven't addressed um, so far. Thank you. So here are the benefits of coming together, if you will. Um, it keeps you up to date on what's going on, right? Because the Women's Fund, you can be sure, is on the pulse. They've got a pulse on everything. Um, they're a ready-made audience for your ideas. They support your actions. They access varied and multiple resources. They've got far reach into the community. Um, they pull their limited resources for a common goal. They achieve things that single organizations or individuals could not. And remember what I tell you, the power is in numbers. Um, and it forms a nucleus for action and it attracts other people. So every time we come together, we attract other people to join us and we expand the base of support. And one of the things that the Women's Fund is looking to do is to potentially, as we move forward with this advocacy and, and inviting you into the umbrella of the Women's Fund, um, is to potentially have you shadow a, a very seasoned advocate um, when you go to do your advocacy so that you can learn from someone and it won't be so daunting or, or scary even um, when you're sitting with an elected official or, or a uh, administrative staff person. So um, stay tuned for more on that. I know that Gloria is looking into that um, thanks to the gracious offer of uh, Deanne Conley Graham who may, may very well end up spearheading that for us. Um, so now it's really important that we look at the three levels of officials, right? So you should know these people. And if you don't, I'm gonna tell you right now, you need to get to know them. We have two state senators. They represent the entire state, um, Senator Rubio and Senator Scott. Senator Rubio is from Miami. Um, so uh, it's, it's easy to get an appointment when he's home from the district. And then you have five US House of Representatives, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, that has a small piece of North Miami-Dade, but mostly Broward. Frederica Wilson, that has the North Miami area. Mario diaz Ballard that has the Western, kind of Northwestern. Carlos Jimenez, which has the middle. And Maria, I'm sorry, Carlos Jimenez, that has the, the bottom of Miami-Dade and Monroe County. And Maria Elvira Salazar, that has Coral Gables and sort of like that center of Miami. Um, the two highlighted were elected in November of 2020 so that you know they're new and that's a good time to go see them. Um, and, and we'll talk about how to go see them when you see them. Now the state, state's a whole nother ball game. So you have six state senators. And the important thing about the state is that this is um, every 10 years when the census comes out, um, the, the legislature engages in what's known as redistricting. So it will look at where everybody is, you know, the census tracks, and it will redraw all of the district lines, which means that the 40 senators and the 120 representatives all must run in 2022. So they're all up for election. Good time to go see them when they need your vote. So Chevron was elected in November as was Ileana and Ana Maria. 
Um, they are, uh, Chev, Chev does most of North Miami. Um, again, like, a, like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a little piece. Uh, Manny Diaz has Hialeah. Ileana Garcia has Coconut Grove, Brickell, downtown. Jason Pizzle, Aventura. Anna Maria Rodriguez, Homestead and up. And then Annette Tadeo, Kendall, and that sort of Western, Western um, uh, Miami Dade. And then you have, so we've got a lot, we've got a big delegation. So mind you, you've got six senators and take a look at how many representatives represent Miami-Dade County. And look at how many were, six of them were elected in November. What's important to note is that Danny Perez is your speaker designate designate. And if you don't know what that is, you know, there's a Senate president and there's a speaker of the house. And this current year, the speaker of the house will be in his last of a two-year term as speaker. Next, next legislative session, um, Paul, Paul Renner will be the next speaker. So currently he's known as the speaker designate because he hasn't yet been, you know, um, uh, he hasn't been brought into office, uh, you know, formally by vote. Um, now, this is how crazy it is in Florida. We know who the speaker designate designate is going to be in 2024, which is going to be Danny Perez. Danny will be representing the, the entire House of Representatives as the leader, and he will be from Miami-Dade County. It's an important person to know because he is a Miami boy and he doesn't forget his roots. So he would, he would be very interested in anything that we're doing here locally that is impacted by state, okay? We also know who the Senate president designate is, and that is, um, uh, so, so uh, Kathleen Pasadomo is from Collier County. She'll be the next woman Senate president. I believe she's the third, third or fourth woman president in the Senate. And we just learned who the president designate designate will be, and that is Ben Albritton from Central Florida. So we now know who our leaders are through 2026, and we're only in 2021. And that's how politics works at the state level. So now we get to the nitty gritty, which is all politics is local, as, all, as, as the former US representative Tippy O'Neill used to say, and he couldn't be more right. This is where it all happens. So let's take a look. So look at, here is your entire county commission. You got 13 commissioners of which six are new, actually seven because the mayor had district eight and she had to vacate her seat in order to run for mayor. So this was a, uh, an appointment to fill a, uh, an open seat. Um, and Danielle Cohen Higgins is now your commissioner in district eight. But those that came on new were the odd districts. In 2022, out goes all of the even characters who have been here forever. Mind you, if we had not put term limits, we would have the same old, same old, same old faces that we've seen now for 20 years. But instead we have new people, Oliver Gilbert, who was the former mayor of Miami Gardens, Keon Hardiman, a city of Miami commissioner, um, Eileen won, Eileen won her reelection. Eileen Higgins won her reelection race. Raquel Regalado, who was a former um, school board member. Keone McGee, who was the minority leader in the House of Representatives in, in Tallahassee. Joe Martinez won his race, a reelection race. And Renee Garcia, who was a former senator, um, won, you know, won that, that seat. So now who will be up? In, in, now campaigning will start very soon. Sean Monastine leaves, Sally Heyman leaves, Rebecca Sosa leaves, Danielle must run again, Javier Soto leaves, and Pepe Diaz leaves. Now we already know that there are some candidates moving in these spots. So be aware, be aware that Rebecca Sosa's seat, uh, Anthony Rodriguez is running. He's a current state representative who's leaving his seat at the state and Pepe Diaz's seat is being sought after by Brian Avila, who is the speaker pro temp currently and is terming out from the house. So in two years, you're gonna see five, six new faces, right? Always a good opportunity because these people don't really, I mean, they don't know anything. So now's a good time for you all to start getting to know them. One, if you don't have relationships with them and starting to educate each one of them on your particular issue and those that are important to the Women's Fund. Um, so I would say first, you better find out who your district commissioner is 
and get in to see them. If any of these are your friends, see them too. And if you have any relationships with them, this is how we build the network, right? If you have a relationship with any one of these, and by that, I mean, do you have their personal cell number? Because I always love when people say, oh yeah, I know, I know Sally. And then you say, okay, well, can you call her? And they go, well, I don't know how to reach her. You may know of her. You may have met her. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you can reach Sally if I need you to reach her. Please let the Women's Fund know where your deep relationships are because we are in this together. So if one of you can reach somebody, we need to know that so we can call upon you to help, right? And I'm assuming that all of you in this workshop want to do just that. You want to, this isn't about egos. And I'm gonna tell you right now, everyone's gotta check their ego at the door. This is about the work. This is about what we do. We're doing it for the people that don't, can't give voice because we're the ones who are in the trenches. We know what they need based on our experience of working with them. And so do you. And each one of you is the most credible advocate but you got to check, check it at the door. It's not about whose agency gets the credit. It's not about who gets the credit. It's about getting the job done. So how does the commission work? Well, you know, it's the legislative body and all of their work goes through eight committees. It's important you know that. If you think that every issue comes to the commission first, it does not. Every issue goes to a committee, right? And these are the committees that they have. So airports and economic development, community safety and security, county infrastructure operations and innovation, uh, health emergency management and intergovernmental affairs, Port Miami and environmental resilience, public housing and community services, recreation and culture and transportation, mobility and planning. Know which committee your agency's work or your personal advocacy work or issues fall under, because that's the one you want to get to know. And you want to get to know who's on those. Every commissioner, the, the commi county commission chairman, which is Pepe Diaz, he has assigned uh, commissioners to each one of these committees. And each committee has a chair and a vice chair. So you want to follow what they're doing, because it has to come out of committee in order to get to the county commission. So that's, that's kind of critically important. So it supports the policies. This committee structure supports the policies, goals, and objectives of the county specific to the committee's jurisdiction. Um, they review items placed on the agenda for board action and facilitate the budgetary discussions. And then they provide support for inter intergovernmental efforts in Tallahassee and Washington. So the county itself has their own lobbying team, right? That lobbies on behalf of those issues that are important to the county. Uh, and they lobby both in Tallahassee and in DC. So I've I'm gonna highlight two, two committees, which I think are critically important because all of our issues fall within these two committees, pretty much. There may be others that, you, that may be specific to you, but the Chairman's Council on Policy is where all policy matters um, actually are born, right? Um, so it crosses the jurisdictions of various committees and the preparation, the transition towards um, elected uh, constitutional officers, right? Because they have a budget as well. So what goes on with the, you know, property appraiser or the, or the, uh, the clerk of courts, you know, kind of goes all through the commission's budget. So this is a really important uh, committee. And um, I think all of you should be following it. So that's, that's this committee. And then take a look at this committee. This is public housing and community services. So the chair is Jean Monastin and Daniela uh, Cohen Higgins is the vice chair. Take a look at who serves this. And this is this committee uh, will hear anything related to community action and human services, the office of management and budget and public housing and community development, which is where most of our work will fall under. So we need to follow what the committee is doing because it's at the committee level that you can stop something from happening before it gets to the commission, which is a much heavier lift. And then of course you come to what we call the administration of the county, right? We happen to have a strong mayor form of government and our new mayor, Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, and I just had lunch with her today and she likes to say that she's the first female and the first Jewish mayor ever to be elected uh, to Miami-Dade County. And she has a strong mayor form of government, which means she's like a, an executive mayor, right? So she, she has a lot of power over her government, right? What she doesn't have 
100% power over is the budget, right? And we'll we'll talk a little bit about how the budget process goes. Um, but she oversees the entire county. She's like the sheriff. That's what we were talking about today. Um, in a couple of years, uh, by, you know that Miami-Dade County is the only county of 67 counties that does not have an elected sheriff. And that is changing based on a constitutional amendment that passed um, last year. And so in 2022, um, we will now have an elected sheriff. That's gonna change the face of Miami-Dade County because the sheriff is the most powerful person in, in any county. They have the biggest budget and they have the most power. So it'll be a real shift for Mayor Living Cava. And I, um, I like to call her the sheriff now because I do believe she's very powerful and um, I agree with her most all the time. So I'm happy to know that there's someone in power that um, is very sensitive to the issues that I uh, personally um, am engaged in, as well as the fund, and I'm sure most of you, right? If you if you watched her campaign and you heard what she had to say, um, she was very much a friend to all of our issues. So I'm very pleased to have her at the helm. Um, she has assembled an incredible leadership team. Jimmy Morales is her COO, and Jimmy was a former county commissioner, former city manager in the city of Miami Beach, comes with years of experience in managing uh, you know, a county. Morris Copeland, who used to be over um, the Department of uh, Juvenile Services is now our Chief Community Service Officer. Uh, I've known Morris for a long time, totally committed to community. Um, Ed Marquez, the Chief, the CFO, he's been around forever and he's kind of one of the brightest bulbs on the tree. And then J.D. Patterson, a dear friend of mine, um, who is now, he was in the police department and he was the assistant Chief of Police in the City of Miami Gardens is now our Chief Public Safety Officer. So you couldn't get a better team. Um, and I'm so pleased that she put some really passionate, compassionate people, but also very qualified in her leadership team. So let's take a look at the difference between legislative and administrative. So the County Commission is legislative, right? So their role is to, you know, legislate. So they pass policy, they pass laws, they pass ordinances. Um, versus the role of the administration, which is the mayor who operates and manages our county government. So you think about your advocacy in relationship to the roles of all of these people, because you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to know your audience, right? And what do they do? What can they do? So that you're not asking, say the mayor to do something that she doesn't have the authority to do, but rather the county commission does. So utilize these people, right? So a county commission member, can often set up meetings with representatives of various departments to address an issue or operational concern or even act as a liaison with the administration. I was a former county commissioner. I always called my county, in, in, in my county, it was the county manager. And I said, you know, I've got a constituency that needs, you know, to maybe meet with, you know, the Department of Parks and Recreation about a program they want to do. And she would say to me, absolutely, let's get them connected, right? So a commissioner can do that. But the mayor, obviously, is, is a overseeing all the departments. So she can also set up meetings for you with uh, her staff and provide the necessary direction and leadership on policy and programmatic issues. And I can tell you um, that I have often called her and she's very quick to respond and she makes sure that my request gets sent to the appropriate person for me to handle the situation with them, right? Because you can't expect the mayor to handle everything. And so I would caution us all to not overuse our relationships with legislators and mayors. Um, try to use them when you've done all you could and you've got you've come up against one roadblock or one roadblock or, or really can't get to the right person, then you can call. But I would suggest you call in the mayor, in the mayor's respect, I would suggest you call her leadership team first before you reach out to her. She's extraordinarily busy, as you can well imagine, and post and, and we're not in post-pandemic. I think we're still in pandemic. So she has got her hands full uh, and she's just coming off of that terrible tragedy in Surfside. So um, I would just caution us to be cognizant that we don't misuse or abuse our relationships with very powerful people. So this is a very important topic uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, in Miami-Dade, we have a, uh, a lobbyist ordinance and believe it or not, I'm gonna tell you, I hope all of you have registered as lobbyists because if you haven't, you're probably in violation. So let's take a look at the ordinance. The ordinance says, this is right out of the ordinance. 
all persons or firms paid or unpaid, employed or retained by a principal who seeks to encourage the passage, defeat, or modification of any ordinance, resolution, action, or decision of the county commission, any action, decision, recommendation of the county mayor or any county board or committee during the time period of the entire decision-making process on such action. Okay, that pretty much says everything because it's the county commission, it's the county mayor, it's a res. Can you imagine a resolution? If you want a resolution for breast cancer month and you went and talked to the county commission about you wanting that resolution, you're gonna be a lobbyist under this ordinance. And so it also includes seeing influencing any action, decision, or recommendation of county personnel, which foreseeably will be reviewed by the county commission or a county board or a committee. So now when you're talking to county personnel, you gotta be careful, right? Uh, and I'll give you the example that I gave uh, to some of the members of the Women's Fund this morning. So let's say you're a pharmaceutical salesperson, right? And you naturally would want to sell pharmaceuticals to Jackson, right? It's the fifth largest health system in the country. Is that a lobbyist? Anybody think it's a lobbyist? It is. They have to register. They're salespeople. Big question here. Um, Deanne is asking, isn't there a fee to register as a lobbyist? We're getting to that. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, we're getting to that. Gloria, I know you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't see it until now. No, ma'am. I was just giving you a thumbs up that yeah, that definitely would be lobbying. Yeah, definitely. So what do county lobbyists are required to do? They must register and pay a registration fee, but it's going to get really interesting here. If the person or the firm is compensated to lobby on behalf of a third party, so I represent people, uh, companies, agencies before the county commission. So I am a paid lobbyist. So I absolutely have to register. Or an employee who lobbies on behalf of his or her employer. So now, if you are AT&T and you are, a, you know, let's say the director of governmental affairs, you're definitely going to be lobbying for 5G for the, for the commission. You better lobby because that puts you in that, that category. And we must register. That, so county lobbyists either have to register and pay the registration fee or register and be exempt from paying the fee. Who's exempt? A principal who lobbies on behalf of his or her organization. Who's the principal? The principal is either the president of the corporation the owner, president, or chief shareholder of a corporation, or an individual who's been designated or has the apparent authority to make a decision on behalf of the corporate entity, or a member of the corporate board who has been appointed by the corporation to serve as its representative during negotiations. Deanne, I see your hand. Yes, ma'am. So I think I've been... <laughs> breaking the rules for a long time probably <laughs> you're not um, alone Dee. so so i've never registered as a lobbyist because i've never been paid to be a lobbyist so i was under the wrong assumption that that was a paid position and that you had to pay when you were going to if you said you were a lobbyist so my question is i have a number of clients I'm I'm a I'm a hired consultant. Right. Uh, some pay me a retainer, some do not. The ones that do not, I still I get paid a commission if something happens, but I'm not getting any money up front. Would I still be considered being paid? And does that mean that I would need to register as a paid lobbyist? So when you see the form, Deanne, you're not even allowed to be paid to, you're not allowed to be paid a commission or a fee to get something done. If you're lobbying, if you're actually going to some, let's say, let's say that you, DN, say to me, um, Vicki, if you, if you get the county commission to appropriate $100,000 uh, to my agency, I will pay you 20 of that. That's called a finder's fee. And that's unallowable under law. Okay. So, so an example, if I have a client that is trying to get a contract with the city of Miami Beach and I get him meetings with certain people within the city and he happens to get that contract 
and he'll pay he pay, he will pay me a percentage of that contract. But if, if I he, don't know ahead if of time. Paying, if, yes. Well, so it, yeah, you don't know ahead of time, and I, my suggestion is he's actually paying you to consult on that contract. He's not paying you because you got the meeting and he got the contract because. You getting him the meeting does not secure that he's going to get the contract. That's right. I mean, it's very clear. It's not a quid pro quo. So I would say that you got him a meeting, right? And the city of Miami Beach has different rules. So that's another thing I should point out. Some of the cities, like the city of Medley, for instance, follows this rule, right? They just want to tag on to whatever the county does, then we're going to do that. But other cities have different rules and different reporting requirements. So I guess the real I guess my real uh, you know, uh, suggestion is everybody find out where you're doing what you're doing and make sure that you are in compliance with the lobbying ordinances in each of the cities. Because the city of Miami is different. The city of Miami Beach is different. God knows we've got, I think it's 54, 45 different um, cities in Miami-Dade and they all do something different. So be just be careful, um, Deanne. Get back to the women's fund for a minute because- yeah. Maria is on staff. She gets paid by the women's fund. Would she have to be a paid lobbyist? Would she no. have to register? She has okay. to register? She's asked to register if she's representing, she, she's okay. the executive director, right? So that's kind of like being the president of the corporation. She is right. the, she is the person yeah. who is an apparent authority, right? So she, she has to register. Absolutely. But, but here's the key. She doesn't have to pay the fee. So let me show you what the fee is, right? Because this is really crazy. So within five days of being retained or before lobbying, and then yearly on January 15th, you have to register. So this is like a I, every, every year I got to remember. And, and if you're working in different municipalities, you got to remember all of this. I, I always tell everybody, if you're working in more than one, you better have a spreadsheet. And it's $490. For, for anyone who is not a principal, because the principal whose lobbies on behalf of his own entity is exempt from paying the fee, right? So Maria doesn't have to pay the fee, she just has to register. That's how it works for principal. So Angel, I know you have your hand up. You are the principal for the Dade County Medical Association. That, 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 that was my question. That was my question. If I'm the one that is, I've been designated by the board. Yep. Uh, to to advocate on behalf of the uh, physicians' issues, uh, then I, you're you're telling me that I have to register, but the fee is waived. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because it's a lot of money, you guys. It's four hundred and ninety dollars every single year. Now I pass that on to my clients because they understand that that's part of the part of the mark, you know, of, of hiring. That, but that it's is for every that is for every city. I mean, for every. Or is that just for the county? That's just for the county. I don't know what each city's um, fees are, which is why, I mean, if I could have done the research, but we'd be here forever. So my point is just make sure that if you're lobbying in the city of Miami, you understand what their lobbying ordinance is. But most of us will be lobbying right now the county's budget. So it's important that we go over this. But look at what you have to, so yearly, yearly, you have to, you know, do your lobbyist registration. Every principal, you have to have a principal authorization for each principal that lobbies representing that for me, because I'm a lobbyist, I have to do a principal authorization to lobby because the other side of it is the principal has to give permission that I have the authority to lobby on their behalf. So, for instance, I represent Agape Network. Agape's principal is the CEO. He has registered. He waived. They waived his fee. I, on the other hand, am his lobbyist. I'm their lobbyist. So I have to register, pay the fee. I had to submit the principal authorization to lobby, which says Agape Network authorizes Vicky Lopez to represent them before the county. And then there's, an, there's a joint affidavit, joint affidavit with the principal where each principal states that there are no contingency or success fees. And this is what, the part I was trying to tell you, Deanne. In the county, it is against the ordinance for anyone to be paid a contingency or a success fee for anything that they lobbied on behalf for the principal. So that's why we're all on retainers. <laughs> I mean, you know, it'd be great to say, listen, you're going to pay me a big chunk of change at the end if I'm successful and I'm pretty successful, but it can't be, just can't be that way. 
And in addition to doing all of that, the county requires you to take a um, ethics course. You have to complete it within 60 days of registering and you, you have to turn the certificate in within those 60 days and you have to take the course again every two years. So the onus has been placed on all of us advocates slash lobbyists to do a lot of this rigmarole. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it, it is the ordinance and I can't stress enough how many people have gotten caught. You know, and, and listen, ignorance is no defense for the law, unfortunately. Um, Mario, you have your hand up. Just for purposes of clarification, as we're sure. asking people in the chat here to sign up to be impact agents who are volunteer or volunteer core. So like last year, I spoke up as an individual person for Lotus House to get their funding at the county. I that's wasn't. Different. But, that's different. That's right. different. And the same thing would be for our, our impact agents who are volunteers. If they want to sure. come and speak on one of these items, is that correct? That's correct. But That's just want to make sure as we keep on public. That you're all feeling that. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure everybody's feeling confused. And listen, you know what I say? If confused, because um, I'm a firm believer in doing things right, um, I would send an email to the Miami Dade Commission of the Ethics and Public Trust. I would commit it to writing. I would I would put down the whole situation, and then I they will respond in writing, and you will have that as your defense, one way or the other. Should I or shouldn't I register? This is what I do for you know for this organization. What if I do this for this organization? Um, I would suggest you get that in writing. Deanne, I see your hand up. Um, I didn't mean to put my hand up. I was actually. Um just going to thank you for this valuable information oh. I meant to give you a thumbs up <laughs> thank, you so much. thank you so much deanne well it's an important listen i i, I made up my, my own agency that i that i lobby for fought me on it until i got them on the phone and they were like oh my gosh all these years and i said yeah 35 years 35 years of not doing it so so now that leads us to relationships okay this this work whether you're an advocate or a lobbyist, let me tell you something. It is all about relationships, right? It, if you don't have a good relationship, then your access and your credibility is um, not as uh, effective. And I think it's really important that you know that. The one thing that I do every day is create relationships, maintain relationships, and, and remember this, that it takes a long time to create trust in relationships and a, and a pretty split second if you lie to a legislator and we'll go through this. I mean, that's the end of that. That's the end of that. So it's really very important that you understand relationships. Oops, I don't know what happened there. Um, I had a slide that would just tell you that in, in fact, the relationships that you will build with them are really based, um, I feel, on um, how you meet with them. And we'll go, we'll go over that um, very carefully. So. How do you do this? You, you're going to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, hopefully, with them. Um, you may not get meetings. Now, when we get to the budget cycle, it's happening starting tomorrow. So chances of you getting one-on-one -on -one meetings with elected officials and or their staff might be a little bit challenging. But when you can and do, it's the gateway for a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and and try to meet them in the district, right? Because in the district, they have more time. So if you try to meet one of these commissioners on a Wednesday, uh, when they're getting ready for county commission, like that's a near, near impossible, near impossible. So wait till they're in their district office, you get a little more time and you get to know them. Talk about who you are and, and research who they are so that you can have like a point of reference with them when you're talking to them, right? Like, I understand that this is a, a, an issue that's really important to you. I hear that your wife, you know, there's plenty of research on, on the, on the uh, elected officials. Um, so once you start making it personal, you start building a personal relationship as well as a professional one. You gotta, you gotta build trust and empathize with them. They're gonna tell you certain things and you're just gonna be rolling your eyes inside of your head, but you're gonna say, yes, I understand. I hear what you're saying, even when they disagree with you. You say, I hear your position. Let me try to let me try again to sort of give you um, maybe this will help you 
change your mind, right? Like we're always looking for ways to negotiate because that's all we do all day long is negotiate with them. And then of course, remember that getting a direct meeting with an elected official might be really difficult and that's okay because the staff members I've always said, who's the most important person in the office, not the elected official, but the staff, the people that are their alleged directors, the scheduler, she's the gatekeeper here. She is the gatekeeper. If you don't have a good relationship with them, listen, I don't know where you go. And we've said it often. They've got to be your best friend. You got to be on a first name basis with them. Susie, listen, it's really important. I get in. I know he's super busy. Um, and this is what happens. If you have a relationship with them, they're like, absolutely. I'll figure that out. I'll move some people around because you have to be the most important request. And you do that by building trust with all of them, the staff and the elected official. So tips on your one-on-one -on -one meetings. Two minute summary, two minutes. I have seen people, it's, it's been painful. I have seen people come into offices and go on and on. And mind you, you've lost them at five minutes and they don't even understand wh why you're there anymore because it should be very simple. Here's my position. It's well-reasoned, it's factual, and it contains the hook, right? It's gotta be something that hooks them in, the heartstring. Like Amanda Altman is famous for, you know, giving the story of the Christie house, right? I mean, seen her do it. She's amazing. Why? Because she has a story to tell and it does tug at their heartstrings. And who's going to be against children who've been sexually abused? Find me that person. I want to find them. I want to talk to them. So, you know, she turns, she can turn the message around. Erin Collins, who, who is constantly on, on this, um, you know, human trafficking. Who's for human trafficking, for goodness sakes? And yet you get resistance. So Erin is a master at her game, turn, turning it around. We just constantly churning. And so try to limit your time to presenting your case to no more than 15 minutes, for God's sakes. And at the state level, you'll be lucky if you get seven. They put you down for 15 and the aide's already knocking at the door at seven. So if you haven't done your job by seven, guess what? You probably haven't done your job. Um, at the state level, as I said, you got, it, you got less time. And I'm, I'm famous for walk and talk. If they're walking, I'm walking with them. If they're getting in an elevator, I've got a 30 second speech for them, right? Because I mean, you got it, it, it's make the best use of the time. And listen, you gotta be all inside their face. They gotta see you all the time to the point where they go, oh my God, okay, I know what I need to do for her. Amanda, your hands up. Jump in and say, you know, I really find that when I, and I make the circuit like a couple a year to meet with all of those people that you put up earlier, Vicki, because it is key to constantly be in their faces. But I also, you know, the one, I always kind of channel my meetings with, with Commissioner Martinez in my mind, because when I sit down with him, he always says to me, what do you want, Amanda? Don't bullshit around with me. Don't, you know, I don't want to just, what do you want? And so I always remember that though, because look, we're busy, they're busy. They don't want the small talk. So I go in and I don't beat around the bush. I tell them what I'm there for and get out. That's it exactly. That's it exactly. And, and I think Amanda makes an excellent point. She doesn't go once a year. She doesn't go twice a year. She's circling in through there because let me tell you something. There are other people that are doing it as often, right? So you've always got to be in front of them. They, they have to know you. They got to walk into a room and the first person they want to go towards is you because they know you, right? And why is that? Because Amanda's been in their face probably six times a year, either, either at her agency, in their office, at an event. And let me tell you something, if you don't know them, do not be afraid to come up to them, take your hand out, shake their hand and say, hi, I'm Vicki Lopez from the Women's Fund of Miami-Dade County. And, I, and I'm so thankful for your support, right? Like just a simple introduction. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself. Look at those people are just like you and me, just like you and me. And quite frankly, you put them there. And in some cases we didn't, but guess what? We're gonna keep them there anyway, as long as they are, and we have to work with them. So don't be afraid. Um, Cause I feel like sometimes there's a lot of fear about introducing oneself at an event. Just do it, do it. They'll appreciate it. Believe it or not, they'll appreciate it. If you can't get an appointment, I told you like in and out, gosh, they're running to the commission. They're running to the bathroom. I'm talking to them. So there's no place where you can't in a, in a public setting, do it. Work with someone who has an existing relationship with a member or a member staff. So for instance, 
I, I get a lot of calls from people who go, do you know so? And well, I'll give you a perfect example. Kathy Fernandez Rundle said to me, you've got a good relationship with Danny Presk and you call him. Absolutely. Right. Because that's what we do. Right. If, if we're all in it together, then just help each other. So don't hesitate to call somebody who has a good relationship. I already told you to arrange it in district. Um, schedule sufficiently far in advance. And let me tell you, they will put you on the calendar and you will get a call a week before. Oh my God, the commissioner has to change this because they had this and this and this come up. You just accommodate them. You don't get upset. You don't say to them, what? You say, oh, no worries. That's my famous, no worries. Tell me, when can she meet with me, right? I will, re, I will remove, I will move people to see her because they have to feel like they're the most important person in the room. And you can't make the staff feel badly about having to reschedule because half the time it's not even them. They're the bearer of the bad news. Don't kill the messenger. Follow up with meetings. Oh, goodness. If you just see them once, follow up. I like to send written cards sometimes. Aaron Collins is famous for written cards. I mean, it's a dying breed, but it really makes a difference. Um, I also, you know, at the legislature, when, you know, the first day of session, I send flowers and I always, they always come back and say, my God, that was so great. I loved having my plan on my desk when I got there. Little things, they're little things. And we talked about being nice to the aides. So communications. Okay. Critically important handouts, one pager, one pager. And let me show you a great, a great example. And I thank uh, Pat Morris uh, for his leadership at the chamber. He and uh, um, and FIU and Wells Fargo, they did the they 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 um, were instrumental in uh, getting the economic impact of the nonprofit sector in Miami Dade County. A, a, an incredible report um, that is that the committee in, at the chamber is going to be using to really make the, uh, the the sort of statement and the issue that look at the nonprofit sector cannot be ignored. Um, but look at how beautiful their, uh, their communications piece is, right? So it's not a bunch of words, it's colors, it's pictures. It tells the, tells the story quite nicely, I think. Um, it, it gives the, you know, how many organizations, the average revenues, the economic impact in nice little, you know, squares, different colors, they can't miss it. Um, and then finally, the future of the sector. So Bam, bam, bam. Pat Morris can go through that in five minutes and make his case. You need to do the same. So this, this is just an example that I wanted to give you because I think it's so important. Three and a half. Three and, three and a half, half minutes, says Pat. Yes, I know, Pat, you're good. You, you adhere to the three minute rule. He is, he's good at what he does. He's been doing it for years. I'm so thrilled that he's with us today and in his capacity in the mayor's office. So public input. Okay, now you're gonna to get to have public input. The mic's gonna be yours, right? You're gonna have an opportunity to either speak to the full body during the budget hearings or at the, um, the town hall meetings. You get the mic, you better be ready, it's three minutes. And they love to press that. You're gonna see the red and the green lights. When you start speaking, the first word, the green light comes on, it's three minutes. When you see the green light flashing and then the red, they're done and they'll cut you off. Okay, that's it, done. So you can't wait until that time if you haven't made the case. So I want you to be extraordinarily succinct and concise about your messaging. And be sure that if you bring more than one person, you people are not getting up there to say the same thing. There's nothing more irritating to an elected official, 10 people saying the same thing and now you took up 30 minutes. Divvy it out. One of you says one thing, the other says the other thing, the other says the other thing, make it interesting. Make them listen to you because the briefer the message, the more apt they are to listen to you. Use a hook, but don't be emotional. My God, I have seen so many people get angry, break down. I mean, it's like, wait a second, I missed, I missed the, the message because you got all emotional up there. And I know sometimes it's hard, especially when people are telling their personal stories. I, for one, have had the, a moment where you break down, but you collect yourself and it's very telling that they know that you're being respectful. Um, you got emotional, you compose yourself, you go back. They really are listening then. Um, and stay civil. Uh, I, I know we've all seen uh, crazy at the public input podium um, and you're just not gonna win 
you're just not going to win if you want to blame people, uh, if you want to get ugly, uh, if you want to tell stories that nobody's interested in, or especially if you're going to tell a story where you're going to like blame a, a, an elected official for something, that's not going to that's not going to cut it. Just want to get your message there and thank them. Thank you for your support. Should be your last four words as the as the button's turning red. Thank you for your support. Do's and don'ts. Oh, and you know what? I'm starting to see something. Hold on, ladies, because I'm starting to see that my PowerPoint is is losing its. Uh, hang on. Here we go. The meeting do's and don'ts, because this is something we have to review. <laughs> um, I see that the poll is there. Thank you so much for showing it, um, Vivi. I'm going to. So meeting dues, let me just get back on here. So, and I don't, I think there's something wrong with the animation. So forgive me how it looks, but we'll just go through it. You know, clearly identify the subject of your interests, keep the list very long. For those that are in it, doing it at the state level, always helpful to have a house or Senate bill number. And if not an ordinance number for the, for the local county commission, because if not, they're like wondering what on earth are you doing? What on earth are you saying? So, okay, hold on, let me move these off here. So we talked about make the connection of the issue and its impact to yourself or to others. Uh, try to determine the member's stance before. Like, listen, I am not going to take an issue to a commissioner or to even a state legislator who has been actively vocal against it. And I'm gonna use Medicaid expansion as a perfect example. Cannot tell you how many people are still talking about Medicaid expansion when the Republican leadership will not even hear it, nor will the governor. So you're up there and you're just making everybody mad because you're just putting it back up there and no one's gonna talk about it. No one's gonna put it on the committee. So be careful that you know what your audience is for and against. And once you know that, then you can work with your messaging. Right. Use your personal experiences, of course. And as I've said, be very brief. Brief, brief, brief. Leave a brief leave behind. Leave. It, it should probably be this big. My God. Should be no, nothing really large. Don't leave pages. Don't leave a binder. Uh, those will find themselves into the recycling bin uh, very quickly. Um, expect questions from them and be responsive to them. And if you don't have the answer, please don't lie. Don't make it up. Tell them that you'll get back to them. Can't tell you how many people have lied, and that's the end of that. You're never going to get back in. No one's ever going to believe you. So you know, but but study. Be be a student of your issue. That's how I became a an expert in criminal and juvenile justice reform. I became a student of it. Um, and and then once they think you're an expert, then they call upon you, which is the best place to be. Right. Discuss. Do not argue. Please do not argue with these people. I've seen arguments take place, and I'm just like, oh wow, that's the end of that. And then whenever possible, get a firm commitment of support. I'm famous for saying I'm counting votes. What, where am I putting you? Are you for or against it? And I'm really direct because sometimes you have to be because they'll hem and haw because they don't want to tell you. And you say, no, no, but I've, I've set my case. So can I, can I count on your support? Will you be voting in favor of this? So I'm really try to get that support because once they tell you, yes, it's really hard for them to get on the dais and do the opposite because they know you'll be back to, to ask them all about that. And then, of course, follow up with a thank you note. Here are the don'ts. Don't be rude. Don't be threatening. I've seen that a thousand times. Don't promise anything that you can deliver that you cannot deliver. Like, and, and that goes both ways. I tell the legislator, do not tell me you can do this if you cannot do it because I'm depending on the truth here, because I need to know, right? I mean, I can't go back and tell the client or, the, or my agency or my board that they said that they could do this and then they don't. And so who's egg, where's the egg on whose face? Mine. Um, don't take out your frustrations on any member of the staff. You know, if you're waiting for 15, 20 minutes for a meeting, you are the nicest person to the staff and they're telling you they're apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry, they're late. You say, I, no worries, it's all good. Keep, keep everyone calm. Don't be self-righteous or overbearing. Um, don't be vague about an issue. They'll know immediately you don't know what you're talking about. 
That's why you can't say, I, I'm here to support all issues that help women. What? <laughs> I mean, so then we're left with, well, what issue? And is it a budget? Does it have a fiscal impact? I mean, they're not stupid. They, they're very smart. They need, to, they need your help. And don't forget to thank them for their past assistance. It, it, when, you, when you have a lot of relationships with a lot of people and they've done a lot of great things, remind them constantly how much you appreciated what they did for you. So what do they need from you? Because it's a two-way street. So they need timely and correct information on pending or proposed legislation. Do not give them anything that isn't correct because they're depending on you. Remember that you're one person coming to see them. Well, guess what? There are probably a thousand people coming to see them every week. And so they need, they need your help to help them do their job and to help them do what you're asking them to do. So give them accurate information, strong and concise communication, patience, patience. I can't stress that enough. Resources. I'm a, I'm a great resource for, for an elected official. I tell them all the time, listen, what can I help you with? Now that I'm asking you, okay, my last question of the meeting is always, so what can I do for you? What do I need to be doing to help you? What, where, where in this little process that I've asked you to do, like I've asked you to pass this bill, okay, what can I be doing to help you so that you don't have to do all the heavy lifting? Those, those are messages that elected officials love to hear. Um, and understanding the issue through exposure to constituents, which, which you can give stories to, um, and how to engage them. So invite them as often as you can to any major event that you're having or any fundraiser. Have them speak. They're looking for opportunities to speak because they're all up for election in 2022. And in the county commissions, there wouldn't be six new seats open. So let me tell you, there was never a candidate or an, or an elected official that doesn't like a microphone because it puts them out there. So invite them. Don't go dark after meeting with an elected official. Never, ever, ever. Keep it up. Like Amanda said, just keep going to see them. <coughs> keep them in the loop of any updates. Like I would go by and say, all right, I went to see all the members of the committee like you asked me to. And here's what I can report. And he and they will say, wow, OK, now you did that. Now we know we've got the support of the committee. So, you know, it's like giving information. You're entering into a partnership with them. Attend their town hall and events. They're going to have town halls. They're going to have events. <coughs> Do it. Go. Tell them that you're there. Talk about them to other people. Introduce them to other people at their town halls. They love that. And then schedule all your follow up meetings after budget hearings. <clears throat> after the legislative session is over, they're coming back home. Many of them will be tired. The budget hearings go on forever. Late, late nights afterwards, after they've had some time to rest, the next call is always like this, or the next text or the next email. I hope that you've had some time for much needed rest and relaxation after all of that. I'm just trying to get in to see you. Please let me know some dates and times that work best for you. Right? So you're not saying, I need to see you now, or I need to see you on this day. Who, who are you to say that? Right. So <clears throat> now when you're representing the Women's Fund, because we're going to talk about the issues. If you're advocating for the Women's Fund um, budget issues for the 2021-2022 budget, then identify yourself when you go to these meetings and say, I'm a community partner of the Women's Fund of Miami-Dade County. And if you're scheduling meetings in advance, don't hesitate to let Vivi know at the Women's Fund that you're having these meetings and that you're gonna be talking on behalf of these budget issues because it helps the fund know how many people have gone to meet with elected officials and have talked about our three budget priorities. Um, in meeting, introduce yourself, state your position with your organization and emphasize that you're a community partner, right? Of the Women's Fund. If you're advocating on behalf of us and also advocating on behalf of your agency, that's perfectly fine. You say, look at, uh, and I'm gonna use Amanda as an example. Um, Amanda says, I'm Amanda Altman. They already know her, but I'm just using her as an example. I'm executive director of Christie House, but I'm also here representing um, some of the budget priorities for the Women's Fund Miami-Dade. That's a great community partner of Christie House. Perfect, perfect. So she gets to talk about Christie House and she gets to talk about how that connects um, with her work. And it would be super helpful if any of you collect intel like if Amanda goes to see Commissioner Martinez and Commissioner Martinez says that I'm never going to be for like no way or I'm going to be for half of it or I'm going to cut the I'll give you half of the budget. 
it's really good for Amanda to let the Women's Fund know, oh boy, I was in with Joe Martinez and this is what he said, because collecting intel is an advocate's greatest strength. And we do this together, which is why the junior leagues of the state public affairs is so absolutely successful in their, in their lobbying and advocacy efforts because we get together and we're about 50 to 75 strong women and all of us are meeting with legislators. So imagine what we're learning. And imagine if I had to go see all the people, right? No, I'm depending on my sisters to go see some of them and to report back. So here are the budget priorities that the Women's Fund has identified in today's budget in the, in the mayor's 2021-2022 budget priorities. So let me just explain this to you. The mayor submits her budget, right? The county commission doesn't necessarily take the mayor's budget and say, that is wonderful, mayor. As a matter of fact, usually the legislative branch, um, just like it does with the governor. So the governor sends the legislature his own budget, right? Well, the legislature says, well, that was nice. We received it upon receipt. And then they bang out their own budget, right? Expect the county commission to do a little bit of that, right? Um, the mayor has put together what she believes is a strong um, budget that um, really addresses all of the issues in Miami-Dade County from resilience to safety to you know, uh, social issues. Uh, you know, I mean, she just has a handle. Remember that she is the founder of the, uh, uh, the Coalition for Human Services, which is when I first met her many moons ago. She has a tremendous pulse on the community as does her staff. So she has not, um, she has not created her budget in a vacuum. I wanna say that she's very clear about having taken a lot of input. So these are the three that fall under the pillars of health and well-being, freedom from violence and economic mobility. So the first one is simply to support the investment of $100,000 that pays for a chief heat officer to protect vulnerable residents and particularly pregnant people from the dangers of common extreme heat. So you would go in and say, we support the mayor's investment of $100,000 for her chief heat officer. And this is why, because it protects vulnerable residents. So simple, simple, uh, one sentence, two sentence um, support. Or, and or, she also has 6.6 .6 million in violence prevention and intervention services for crisis counseling, safe shelter, transportation, and other services to victims of domestic violence and their immediate family. So that's another one that we support. And lastly, under economic mobility, we support the mayor's proposed increased investment in early childhood education. Her budget includes 3 million to provide 400 new slots for three to four year old low income children and families with enhanced preschool education. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, pretty direct. This should not take long to tell them what you are interested in. So, if you get a chance, and I wanted to show you, however, there'll be some smart people who you'll be talking to, and they may want to know more about this 6.6 .6 million, right? So I always say, do your homework. So here's the homework. So within that 6.6 .6 million is 16 additional positions funded by food and beverages taxes. She's got 60 new beds and a fourth location. She also has um, the purchase of In Transition North, which was uh, founded by the Junior League of Miami. Um, and it is a facility, a, a really wonderful domestic violence facility. And she also has uh, the psychological division providing counseling to victims that were treated under the domestic violence programs. So that's, that's knowing your thing, right? That's knowing your stuff. So for those of you that get more time, when you talk about this one, you can then add an explanation about the 6.6. .6. If you don't have a lot of time, then that's what you're gonna say, that you support her increased investment, right? And then of course we come to our next steps, which is here we go. And this is always a fun time. I call this the fun exercise of the county. The Board of County Commissioners are gonna convene and they're gonna take two votes on September 9th and on September 28th. Both meetings will begin at 5.01 PM in the commission chambers. Prior to the commission votes though, there are gonna be some budget town hall meetings 
around the county where the mayor's staff is going to present her proposed budget. Okay, and all those meetings are going to begin at 6 p.m. except for the South Dade Cultural Center meeting, which is going to begin a little later. So here is our schedule for this week. Tomorrow <laughs> at Westchester Regional Library, which will be broadcast in a virtual format and at West Kendall. And on Friday at Arcola Lakes Branch Library in Miami and Miami Lakes Branch Library. So those are the two that are taking place this week. So tomorrow and Friday. The following week, it will be at the North Dade on Monday, the North Dade Regional Library that will also be broadcast in a virtual format and also in Aventura at the Northeast Dade Aventura Branch Library. And on Tuesday at the South Dade Cultural Arts Center and in the Naranja Branch Library. And that the South Dade one begins at seven to give people an opportunity to get down after work so far south. So that's the beginning of this process where the mayor's staff will talk about the budget in great detail. I would urge all of you to attend. I would urge you as well to um, get, get these uh, three uh, women's fund priorities and any other priorities that you have, divvy it out um, and let them know that you're in support of her budget, okay? Because that's important. Um, what she's doing is building a groundswell of support around the community. And so next steps, if you can schedule a meeting with your county commissioner or any other commissioners with whom you have a relationship and let them know what, what you're in favor of in her budget, determine which town hall meeting to attend and provide comments of support during public input. If you're advocating under the umbrella, please communicate your advocacy efforts with Viviana and then attend those two county commission budget hearings and provide comments of support during public input. So that is, um, Arathi, you have your hand up? Yeah, I was gonna wait till you finish and-, and uh, Well, I, I am I'm actually at the end of my presentation and we'll take all kinds of questions. Now, I know it was a lot of information, um, but we wanted to sprinkle you with a lot of stuff so that we can drill down in the months to come um, because as I said, we're really kind of very late to the game, given that town hall meetings start tomorrow. Next year, I hope we'll start in May, making our voices known and really, you know, kind of mobilizing our own troops uh, around the county for those things that we find really need to be um, accomplished. So, Arathi, why don't you go and then Pat Morris will go after you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for an amazing presentation and everybody will be recorded because I know there's tons of things that I want to go over again because you just, you're in flow. As I tell you, when you talk about this, you are in flow. It's so helpful and I really appreciate it. Um, when you spoke, um, I think it was two years ago at the Women's Fund, um, there was a summit and you were talking about messaging and it, you gave a really great story and you were talking about how to help change people's minds. Like, and you used um, the example of when you're talking, maybe you were talking about LGBTQ bullying and you're talking to conservatives and you were talking about how to create that connection of like maybe um, met using your messaging as talking about family values. Can you just open up a little bit about that of really creating the commonalities and, and when you're talking about your messaging and who you're talking to? Yeah, so, so it, it's a very good question. I mean, remember that we are, uh, despite the fact that uh, county commission races are um, nonpartisan, it's a lie. They're very partisan. Uh, I like to say they don't run on a partisan basis, but, uh, but you know who the Republicans are and you know who the Democrats are and you know who the independents are. And so really it's very um, important to kind of know your audience and the values that they hold, right? So the, the example that Arathi is, is referring to was if you go see a very conservative member of the legislature or the commission, and you're talking about a, a topic like LGBTQ issues, I mean, that really does not resonate with them, right? So we make the case about families, right? So we, we know what is it that does resonate with them, right? So it would be families, uh, inclusion, um, you know, having a, a little bit of like potentially noting somebody, I always love noting, um, you know, the Cheneys who had a gay daughter, um, very strong Republican uh, family. And I say, you know, they were, they, they were faced with this very same issue. And yet the love of their child, the love of family, the love of values uh, 
allowed the Cheneys to embrace Liz and to really, you know, just stand beside her and support her. So it, it's 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 a way of kind of navigating your communication strategy so that you are hitting upon those things that are important to them, despite the fact that your issue may cause them some consternation. You know what I mean? So, so that was a very good um, question, Arathia. Clearly, we all have to learn to dance around people's political positions and their personal values and their, and really just what they believe in their beliefs, you know? Um, so yes, that's a, that was a very good point. Pat. You're on mute, Pat. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, first, first of all, Vicki, thank you. Um, as always, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know Vicki, this is the master class that you would take <laughs> on advocacy. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, I, you know, the point I want to make is, you know, for those of you who know the mayor, you know that, you know, advocacy on behalf of issues in our community, you know, this is what she'd been doing for the last 30 years. This is what got her to be elected as a county commissioner and now as a mayor. She's in a different role now, being on the inside. And it's her budget. She needs our help in the community to communicate the importance of the things that are important to you. You know, she's all about democracy. There is nothing more uh, de democratic in action than what you're doing today, listening, and then the follow up plan, whether it's at uh, the sessions that are going to be held the next couple of days talking about the budget. So, you know, thank you all for that piece of it. Uh, it's important to the mayor. She's going to be at uh, just about all of those uh, sessions. I'm going to be at the one, in fact, uh, tomorrow night and Friday, and then one next week with uh, some folks from OMB. Um, the other thing that I, I just, you know, kind of wanted to say is for those of you who went through the Thrive 305 uh, process with the mayor, uh, you know, there was a very intentional thing to that. Most mayors come into town in a new position and they say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. The mayor, you know, despite the pandemic and everything else that's been going on, um, spent about four or five months listening, doing a survey, 27,000 people, over 100,000 responses, doing 17 in, in, uh, in person and virtual sessions to hear from people like us, residents. Uh, who, you know, many who have not been involved in any kind of political process in the past. And so part of what this budget is going to reflect is what you have been telling her you want to see what's important to you, whether it's parks, whether it's safety, whether it's women's issues. That's what's going to be reflected in a great part. And we tried to tickle that out into the budget that I think you'll see if you get to these presentations. Some of the things that you've been telling us as residents and, and as advocates as well, but really first as advocate, as, as residents, you wanted to see the county focusing on, uh, you know, more money for CBOs, uh, you know, a, a focus on safety, a focus on parks, all things that came out, you know, sustainability for the, for the, uh, the, you, the, uh, the, the social sector, right, for the, for the nonprofit sector. So a lot of that's going to be in there. You're going to see it you know, we're not going to all get it right, but but your championing this budget is going to keep a, a, a key part of us, you know, honestly making this Miami-Dade County government more transparent and more responsive and more trustworthy than I, quite frankly, I think it's ever been in the 30 years that I lived here. So, uh, so thank you all. And Vicki, thank you so much for your, oh for my your gosh. time volunteering. Pat, it's been such a privilege and honor to work with you all these years uh, in, in these very same silos. Um, and I'm just uh, pleased that we can gather together a community in support of her budget. It's clear to all of us that she's always been a friend of the fund, always been a personal friend of mine, but also of all the issues that we talk about every day. So, you know, and she's really lucky to have you. I was sad to see you, you know, kind of go from where you were, but uh, she is so lucky to have you, Pat. And as she is, Susan Holtzman, I mean, she's got a terrific team. Um, and honestly, I just hope that you all are able to continue to do what you're already doing in the very short time you've been in office with facing some pretty incredible challenges.
So thank we, you. We, we, we got a whole lot of big impact to come. So we're only getting started. We're okay, excited. Vicky. You're welcome. Thank you. it, are there any other questions or anything that I can help you all with? Uh, Carolina is asking if, you know, the Women's Fund, if we're going to coordinate some group participation in the budget hearings and those those slides are some yes, those who are you are interested, we would love to coordinate and to go together and Deanne Connolly Graham is going to lead the charge Carolina so come back from Utah and coordinate with Deanne because we're going to thank you perfect. And I, I, you. I would be awesome. remiss if I didn't thank um, the leadership of Adele and Danielle and the Advocacy Committee. They were most helpful uh, in preparing uh, me for this, you know, all the work that they did reviewing the budget. Thank you so much, Adele and Danielle, for being there, you know, just kind of holding, holding space for me. And to all of you, to my friends who are on here, thanks for coming. I think you've heard this before, but listen, thank you for your support. And for those that I didn't know that I now count as new friends. Uh, in the fight for what's right. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And thank you again, Women's Fund, for inviting me to share um, this important information with everyone. So I'll have to say uh, of the fourth pillar, the fourth pillar that we have is leadership. And there's nobody who embodies that more than you, Vicki. And I hope we all see you as our mirror today, right? Yes. Everybody needs to be more confident. Look at Vicki. She's telling us, yes, we can do it. We have the voice to support women and girls in our community. It's everybody wins. There's nothing, there's no reason to hold back. And we're a little bit organized now and we're gonna be even better organized as we, as we move forward. So we invite you all to join us at what we call the Central Plaza where people can come up from across Miami from very, very, very different perspectives to join, to focus on women and girls and what we can do to support them. The website, womensfundmiamidade.org is a really easy place to go and meet because you can sign up and say, I want to be in contact and we will be in contact with you in our impact collaboratives, including the one on September 2nd. Many of you talked about um, mental health. We're looking at mental health for, for girls. Uh, we come together, we look at issues that are, are affecting women and girls in our community and you all own then what we do next with that information. So please join us and and keep in touch and since it is 5 59 i am going to let you gloria and you vicky say your last thanks to everybody for being here gloria excellent thank you so much everybody we obviously are incredibly grateful to you vicky for your time and talent we know that you have choices about how you allocate that amongst the many valuable organizations in this town and we're blessed to have you um, devote some of it to us here at the Women's Fund Miami Dade. We are living in complicated times folks. I know each of you are navigating challenges, pitfalls, frustrations, and I really believe that fundamentally how we emerge from these challenges is all about leadership and leadership that is truly focused on the common good leadership that is empowered, and leadership that is no ego. It's really just about the opportunity to truly make Miami-Dade a place where women and girls can thrive. And I do believe that by locking arms here at the Women's Fund, we can do the both and. We can support our individual organizations in our mission, and we can coalesce under the big tent that is the Women's Fund Miami-Dade to truly make Miami Day the place where women and girls can thrive. So thanks again, everybody. Wishing you all a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You're the people who show up. Thank you, Vicki, so much. Gloria, I hope this feels like a really great way to celebrate your birthday. Yes, absolutely. I would never want to do anything other than being surrounded by this amazing cadre of leaders on my fit, my, my half century mark. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Happy Arty. birthday, Gloria. Big hug. Thank Arty. you. <laughs> Arthur, your birthday, birthday Eve. Gloria. And happy birthday early to Arthi and to Danielle Prendergast, all my fellow yes. Virgos in the room. Another one here. Oh. I'll end Carolina. Enjoy and celebrate, ladies.
Vicky, this was yeah. amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank oh you God, so Dan. much. You are such a good fan of mine. I just am so honored to be in the fight with you. Oh, my dear. I will be reaching out to you because you are just, I, I've got to get more of this valuable wisdom from you. You're amazing. So we'll be definitely talking. Thank you so much for today. You're so welcome, Deanne. Take care. Thank, thank you, you Maria, Arathi, thank Maria. You. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Vicki. Bye, Bye all. Amazing. Take care. Amazing. Lori, see you. Let me just say, Judith, welcome home. Yes, Judith, welcome home. Welcome back. Yeah. You found your new home here, too. You're welcome here. Malia, I hope you sold a lot at Dragonfly. Well, while we're here, hopefully they're going ka -ching at the let Dragonfly thrift right now as we speak. So Vicki, we will- um, Yes, I'll see you all very soon. soon Absolutely. Forever. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll Absolutely, no worries. Digest and, well, and go on with the next steps. Vivi, you're Vivi, a great you. driver. Yes, Vivi, if you'll send me the poll results and then the chat, the chat stuff, that would be great just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Thank you so much again, Maria. To Milana, it was so good to meet you. Meg, so great meeting you. And the rest of you on here, Danielle, thank you so much for your support. And all of you, um, thank you for joining us today. Thank I you, Vicky. I will see you all very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Vicky. Thanks.